There's a term called oxymoron. It consists of two Greek words traditionally translated as sharp and dull, or sharp and foolish, which in the final translation into English should sound like smart fool or dull sharp wit. This word is used to denote two entities whose combination is impossible, such as dry water, hot snow, living corpse, and similar combinations of the incompatible. The history of pre-Columbian America is also an oxymoron. On the one hand, the Native Americans built cities, roads, and large temple complexes from huge stones. Yet, on the other hand, they had nothing to process these stones with, since they were not aware of iron and iron tools. And they also did not know the wheel and had no idea of what a potter's wheel was. But they built cities and roads. In short, a total oxymoron. Moreover, Native Americans had no draft animals. Horses, donkeys, and large cattle appeared in America along with the Europeans. But the Native Americans built roads. For whom did they build these white roads, or sockbi in the Mayan language, if there was no one to harness to a cart? As mentioned in the two previous films, the once omnipotent Roman Catholic Church, whose power was significantly curtailed by the Protestants and the Westphalian system of sovereign states, decided to make substantial corrections to the history of the Christianization of Latin America and declared, not earlier than the second half of the 17th century, that all pagan temples of the Maya, Aztec, and Inca Native Americans were pre-Columbian constructions of pre-Columbian Native American civilizations. After such declarations and instructions from the top management, Catholic historians had no other option but to adapt the scientific justification to this historical scheme. The Protestants didn't object, and by playing along with the Catholics in extending the history of Christianity, they also rewrote their national history in a more favorable light. All other countries, to some extent dependent on Catholics and Protestants, accepted the extended version of history as given. We will talk about the global extension of human history in the following films. But now we are going to discuss the so-called pre-Columbian roads of the Maya and Inca Native Americans. I want to clarify right away. The Roman Church, when it ruled and extended its own history, as well as world history, did everything correctly, because an unretouched and unedited history could have spoiled the image of the Catholic Church as a Christian church which it only became at the end of the 15th century. With the only caveat being that until the 19th century, the Christianity of the Roman Church contained elements of paganism and polytheism. And since we're on the topic of lengthening history, it would be fitting to quote George Orwell in his immortal work. The party insisted that Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. Winston Smith knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia as little as four years ago. But where did this knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case was soon to be extinguished. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past? Ran the party slogan. Controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. The Roman Church knew even before Orwell that without control over the past, it could lose its future. The Vatican gradually realized that the pagan practices in the New World, being tolerated by the Franciscans and other monastic orders, would discredit the Church. So historians were given the following task. The Roman roads of Latin America, leading, among other places, to pagan temples, had to become the pre-Columbian roads of the Maya, Aztecs, and Incas. The historian said that the task was clear and delved into the archives where diaries and manuscripts were stored, such as those of Diego de Landa, a Spanish Franciscan missionary in the Yucatan province. He was the second bishop of Yucatan between 1572 and 1579. After carefully reading his diaries, historians immediately concluded that these diaries needed to be hidden and shown to no one. And readers of his book, Report of the Affairs in Yucatan, we're told that it was published based on incomplete copies of his manuscripts, which, according to some researchers, disappeared without a trace after the monks were expelled from Meridia in 1820. In 1862, one of these copies of unknown origin 
was discovered in Madrid by the great Mayanist Charles Etienne Brasseur de Borburg, and in 1864, he published the Spanish text of this copy in his own French translation. And now, here's the place in Diego de Landa's book where it talks about ancient pre-Columbian Indian buildings and the same ancient pre-Columbian roads. The second most significant buildings in this land, so ancient that everyone has forgotten who founded them, are the buildings of Tio, now the city of Meridia, which are 13 leagues away from the buildings of Ismael, and 8 from the sea, like others. And today, signs remain that there were once a very beautiful road between them. In the 20th century, the renowned Mexican Mayanist Alfonso Villarroja references this book in his article in the journal Contribution to American Archaeology in the 1934 issue. I quote, Hidden in the forest and almost obliterated, there are still to be found in certain parts of Yucatan the remains of old paved roads, which in bygone times must have joined the principal cities of the new empire of the Maya. The natives of the region called these paved roads Sakbiab, which means white roads, perhaps in memory of their appearance when they were covered with fine saskab. Saskab in the Mayan language, white earth, is used on the Yucatan Peninsula for the preparation of construction mixtures. The friable limestone rock, described as decomposed limestone or limestone mixture, abundant deposits of this material in Yucatan are called Saskabaris, and further in the same place. Their great age can be inferred from the fact that at the very beginning of the conquest, all were already abandoned and in a very bad state of preservation. In 1566, Diego de Landa, the earliest historian of the peninsula, speaking of the marvelous buildings of Tio, Meridia, and the Ismael, wrote, There are signs nowadays of there having been a very beautiful causeway from some to others. This is the first mention of the old white roads. And now listen to a sample of pseudoscientific gibberish from Wikipedia on why the Indians built these roads. The Maya did not have a beast of burden suitable for carrying goods over long distances, so it is likely that the Sakbiab would have been regularly walked by traders, though the Maya are also known to have used water routes. I remind you that the Maya had neither pack nor draft animals, and what traders have to do with it is unclear as if, in the absence of pack animals, traders became pack animals. And below, it says, Natives told John Lloyd Stevens, American diplomat and explorer, that ancient Mayan couriers used the Sakbiab to deliver messages between large cities. How did they deliver messages? On foot? Just say it straight, that these roads were exclusively for pedestrians. Or are you hesitant to openly write such nonsense? For example, K. Chris Hurst, a member of the Society of American Archaeology from 1986 to the present, did not hesitate and wrote in her article that the roads of the Incas, this is already South America, were built exclusively for pedestrians and small pack animals. I quote, The Inca road includes 25,000 miles of roads, bridges, tunnels, and causeways, a straight line distance of 2,000 miles from Ecuador to Chile. Construction followed existing ancient roadways. Incas began improving it as their part of imperial movements by the mid-15th century. Way stations were established every 10 to 12 miles. Use was restricted to elites and their messengers, but commoners maintained, cleaned, and repaired and set up businesses to cater to travelers. Since wheeled vehicles were unknown to the Inca, the surfaces of the Inca roads were intended for foot traffic, accompanied by llamas or alpacas as pack animals alpaca, a relative of the llama weighing about 70 kilograms. Some of the roadways were paved with stone cobbles, but many others were natural dirt pathways between 3.5 and, and 15 feet, 1 to 4 meters in width. 4 meters, a nice spacious sidewalk. I'll add for myself. The roads were primarily built along straight lines, with only a rare deflection by no more than 20 degrees within a 3-mile or 5-kilometer stretch. In the highlands, the roads were constructed to avoid major curves, apparently so pedestrians wouldn't drift on these steep turns. I also added that for myself. The roads were primarily built for practicality, and they were intended to move people, goods, and armies quickly and safely across the length and breadth of the empire. According to 16th century historical writers, 
such as Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, people walk the Inca road at a rate of about 12 to 14 miles or 20 to 22 kilometers a day. Accordingly, placed along the road at every 12 to 14 miles were tambos or tampu, small building clusters or villages which acted as rest stops. These way stations provided lodging, food, and supplies for travelers, as well as opportunities for trading with local businesses. That is, the roads of the Incas as well as the roads of the Maya, according to the official history of Latin America, were built for pedestrians, and in no way for wheeled carts, while in the rest of the world roads were built exclusively for wheeled transport, so that the narrow wooden wheels of carts would not sink into the soft ground and not break the road after rain. Lengthening the history of pre-Columbian America, historians have backed themselves into a corner. Before the 16th century, before the Europeans, the indigenous people did not have draft or work animals. Maya and Aztec didn't even have small pack animals like the Incas, which means the wheel in their economy, as part of a transportation vehicle, was absolutely pointless, as well as the vehicle itself, if there was no one to harness it to. Hence the nonsense with supposedly pre-Columbian roads. So they had to be called sidewalks, the federal and international sidewalks of Latin America, sorry, pre-Columbian America. But here too, historians have inconsistencies. It is more comfortable for a person to walk on trampled, compacted earth rather than on stones. On the Great Silk Road, there was not a single road like the Inca or Maya, although the flow of goods was much greater than in America. Camels and any other pack animals prefer to step on soft ground rather than hard, sharp stones. Llamas also preferred walking on grass rather than stony roads. Llamas managed just fine without roads. The main job of horses was to pull a cart. In good weather, it was done on a firm dirt road. If the dirt road became wet after rains, the cabman moved the cart onto the gravel path, and it was most convenient for pedestrians to walk along the trampled path beside the road, and certainly not on stones. This is how Isaac Levitan, a Russian artist, saw the Vladimirsky Tract in the 19th century, one of the main roads of the Russian Empire. This road was paved with asphalt in the early 20th century. Due to the fact that horses had to pull a cart not only on a dirt road, but also on a gravel road or cobblestones and on boulders, horses' hooves were shod with iron horseshoes. But in the Mongolian steppes, there were no gravel roads, so Mongolian horses were not shod. However, they would have to be if they were to move along stony roads. Most of the Inca road system consisted of such roads. Stones quickly overgrew with grass, well fertilized by horse manure. It was comfortable for the horse's hooves and good for the cart's wheels. They didn't sink into the ground after rain. They didn't damage the road. The horse and cart moved as if on a carpet. It could be said that this was an everlasting road and the longer it was used, the smoother and more comfortable it became for both the horse and the cart's wheels. Roman roads were the same, exactly the same, but only until historians removed all the turf from them, together with the ground to show them to tourists. All that's left for us to do is wonder why the Romans built such bone-shaking roads. But not all roads were paved with stones. About 90% of all roads were gravel. In Europe, in Asia, in America, and in Australia. Then, they were all paved with asphalt, and in this form, covered with asphalt, Roman roads still serve us to this day. In the next film, we'll discuss who built these roads and why, and especially for those who wish not only to know but also to understand history and its cause and effect relationships, I offer you my book, The Other History of Roman Empire. That's all for me. I appreciate your time and attention and wish you all the best. Respectfully. Alexander Tamansky